بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أحمده وأصلي على رسول الكريم وإن تنعزأتم في شيء فردوه إلى الله ورسوله Today I want to talk about uh, difference of opinions You see when you have a text that gives you a command or gives you an encouragement or gives you a negation that or prohibition tells you don't do something you still have to apply your aql your intelligence on the text and when different people apply their t their understanding on the text they will come to a different conclusion it is not as simple as saying the slogan that people have made very famous Quran and Sunnah Quran and Sunnah in fact the Prophet has never said Quran and Sunnah in the way that we say Quran and Sunnah the Prophet has said wa ma'aliya was habi for example the Prophet has said different words uh, he, the Prophet says uh, about following him, his sunnah and the sunnah of Khulafa al-Rashidin al-Mahdiyin imsakum bin nawajir the Prophet has said many different things but he's never said Quran and sunnah as if Quran and sunnah in black and white will give us a clear answer and it is in this regard that I'm going to go over about uh, close to 96 questions that people of Quran and sunnah Shaykh Albani Rahimullah, Shaykh bin Baz, may Allah have mercy on him. Shaykh Uthaymeen, may Allah have mercy upon him. May Allah have mercy upon all of them. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this talk of mine uh, for a better understanding using them, okay? For understanding that what we mean by Quran and Sunnah doesn't mean that the text is talking to you. No, the text isn't. There's aql and naql. There's the naql which is the text and then your aql on the text and so you have to have principles as you will see okay on how to apply the text now let us get started today bismillah i want to do this as quickly as possible so let me just uh, so in the chapter of tahara for example what is the ruling regarding the use of utensil containers from gold and silver or general use for other than drinking or eating from them okay so Sheikh bin Baz said it is not permissible meaning haram to use utensil or containers made of gold and silver it is not permissible to eat or drink from that which is made of gold or silver okay nor is it permissible to use gold golden or civil utensils for any other purpose even pens made of gold or silver are not permissible to be used by men or women okay they are not considered jewelry so you see let's just continue and then I'll continue inshallah Sheikh Uthaymeen says using gold and silver other than drinking or eating utensils is permissible it's so completely opposite then Sheikh Albani says using gold containers is forbidden using gold containers is forbidden as for silver it is forbidden to eat or drink from but other use is permissible so here you have people who apply very strictly we know the Zahiri Mazhab they look at the Hadith they look at the Quran and they come to three different conclusions regarding a very simple question and the point here is not to throw punches please uh, be very clear about this Okay, uh, can tanning skins of dead animals be pure? Okay, can tanning skins of dead animals be pure? Sheikh bin Baz answers, what? If the skin of an animal whose meat is halal, it is tanned, it becomes pure. So, if it is a skin of an animal whose meat is halal, it becomes tanned, it tan, you take the skin of the animal you, you have, you put it in the sun as long as it's a halal animal right like a goat and sheep as for the animals whose meat is forbidden to eat tanning will not render its skin pure Sheikh Uthaymeen says 
The preferred opinion is that the skin of an animal does not become pure unless the animal is halal when slaughtered. Halal when slaughtered. Not just the animal, but halal at the time of its being slaughtered. If the slaughtering does not render an animal halal, then its skin remains impure even if it is tanned. Okay? So, uh, let's say there is a small uh, a cow that does not have two teeth yet. You kill it, you cannot tan its skin. Okay? Sheikh Albani says, the skin of an animal becomes pure even if were if it were the skin of a pig. Okay, so Sheikh Al-Bani says, take any skin of any animal, whether halal or haram, because of the hadith of the Prophet, that if you tan a skin, literally that's what it means, if you tan a skin, then what? Then, uh, then it is uh, halal. That's the literal meaning of the hadith. And you, for the previous question about gold and silver, what is jewelry? What is not jewelry? How do you define these things? Right? What are your definitions? So this is where you need more than just the text. If it was as simple as the knowing the text and therefore we know the answer, if it was as simple as that, the Sahaba would have never differed. What is the ruling regarding facing the Qibla in answering the call of nature? Sheikh bin Baz says, it is not permissible to turn towards the Qibla or to turn one back to the Qibla during the call of nature outside. It is permissible inside the buildings, though it is better to avoid it. Sheikh Uthaymeen says, it is not permissible to turn towards the Qibla or to turn one's back to the Qibla during the call of nature outside. Inside the buildings, turn, turning one's back to the Qibla is permitted, but not facing it. Now, all of this is based upon the sayings of the Prophet. Sheikh Uthaymeen says, inside, you can't face the Qibla, but you can give your back to it. Sheikh Al-Bani says, something completely different again. It is not permissible to face the Qibla or to turn one's back to it during the call of nature, neither inside nor outside. What is the ruling regarding the cutting off the beard beyond the length of the width of the fist? Okay, beyond the qabd. Okay, Sheikh bin Baz says it is not permissible. Now remember, the Prophet said, "Ya'falluha," right? So let the beard go. Now Sheikh bin Baz says it is not permissible to cut anything off the beard, even if it get longer than the width of one's fist. So I don't know how this is because uh, Umar bin Khattab, uh, you know, and other companions also took one qabd and cut off their beard. Sheikh Uthaymeen says it is not permissible to cut anything off the beard also. Sheikh Albani, the sunnah practiced by the righteous predecessors is to grow the beard except what is beyond the width of the fist which should be cut off. Completely different. Now they're all following Quran and sunnah. One says you have to let it go. The other says you have to cut it if it goes beyond. That's the way of the righteous predecessors. What is the ruling regarding uttering tasmiya in wudu? So how, how important, what is the ruling regarding saying Bismillah, Rahman, Bismillah uh, during wudu? Bin Baz, it is obligatory, it is wajib to utter Bismillah at the beginning of wudu according to a group of scholars. Ibn Uthaymeen, uttering tasmiya in wudu is sunnah. Okay. Now, Sheikh Uthaymeen, how did he come to this conclusion? Because the Prophet said, Look at the text. The Prophet said, say, the, pro the Prophet said, Bismillah. But you have to use your brain. You have to use some way of understanding how do you determine Sunnah? How do you just determine as Fard? So on and so forth. Albani says, uttering tasmiyah in wudu is wajib. Okay? So, what is the ruling regarding keeping the order tartib in making wudu? Keeping the order in wudu is wajib, according to Sheikh bin Baz. Sheikh Uthaymeen says keeping the order of wudu is wajib. Sheikh Albani says keeping the order in wudu is ghayr wajib. It is sunnah, and Allah knows best. So basically, if I was washing my face, okay, and then I was washing my arms, but I happened to wash my arms and then wash my face, uh, according to Sheikh Albani, this would be okay. According to the other two, this was not okay. Question number nine, is it 
legal, yashrah, is it part of the sharia to repeat the wiping of uh, in the head? Sheikh bin Baz says wiping of the head is done once. It is not recommended to repeat the wiping. Sheikh Uthaymeen says wiping of the head is done once. It is disliked to repeat the wiping. Sheikh Albani says it is related from the Prophet authentically that he wiped the head repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly. Question 10. Does one have to renew wudu after carrying a deceased person? So you carried the janazah of someone, do you have to do wudu? Sheikh bin Baz says, it is not recommended to make wudu for the one who carried a deceased person. Sheikh al-Bani, it is recommended to make wudu for the one who carried the deceased person. These are people who are looking at the text. But do they have asuls? Do they have principles or are they just randomly just looking at the text and deciding? I'm not sure about that point. Because if you don't have principles, at what point does something become uh, fard or wajib? At what point is it going to be sunnah? Right? How do you determine that if a statement or an action is done by the Prophet, how do you determine? What is the status of that hukum? What is the ruling regarding wiping over leather socks, khufain, or thin socks? Now notice this, one of the prerequisites of wiping over leather or normal socks is that they should be thick and should cover the area of the foot that must be washed up to the ankles. Sheikh bin Baz says this. Sheikh Uthaymeen, according to the correct opinion, it is permissible to wipe over leather or normal socks even if they are thin. Complete opposite. The condition that the socks must cover the area that must be washed as stated by some scholars, is not correct, he says. There is no proof for it. Because what? They're looking for proof in the text. <coughs> Sheikh al-Bani, wiping over normal socks is permissible even if they are thin. Now, it really boggles my mind for a person who is looking at the Vahid text to have this opinion, especially about wiping the socks. But, hey, whatever, right? Question number 12. If one makes wudu by wiping over one's foot gear, leather or normal socks, and then takes them off, will his wudu be lost? So I did wudu, I did uh, masha over my uh, hufain, okay? Now I took them off. Now what happened? The Sheikh bin Ba says, wudu is nullified. He has to make wudu again. Sheikh Uthaymin says, if one takes his leather socks or normal socks after having made wudu by wiping over them, he does not lose his wudu according to the correct view. Sheikh Albani says, if one takes his leather socks or like after having made wudu, he keeps his wudu. So this is the opinion of... What is the ruling regarding wiping over one's shoes? Wiping over the shoes does not is not permissible. Wiping over the shoes, la yajuz. Sheikh al-Bani says, wiping over the shoes, yajuz. It's allowed. And I'm guessing here, you know, that one is assuming, one is assuming najas, and the other is assuming no najas, right? So one is saying, no, the, the, the status quo, the default is, it's pure, and the other is assuming the default is impure. Okay, what is the ruling regarding wiping over a cast? Okay, over the splinter. Sheikh bin Baz says wiping, okay, over the splint cast is permissible. Okay, Sheikh Uthaymin says wiping over the splint cast is permissible. Sheikh Al-Bani says wiping over the splint is not permissible. Does one lose wudu if he touches his private parts? Touching the private parts directly nullifies the wudu with or without lust. This is Sheikh bin Baz. Sheikh Uthaymin says, touching the private parts with lust nullifies wudu. In another occasion, he said in his book, okay, Shar uh, al-Mumti, that if one touches his private area, it is recommended for him to make wudu irrespective of if he touches it with lust or without lust. The view that one must make wudu if he touches it with lust is the strong one, but I do not require wudu from touching with uh, lust 
uh, I do not require wudu from touching from lust. Rather, I say that one needs to make wudu just in case. Albani says, touching the private parts with lust does not nullify the wudu, but if it is done with lust, the wudu is nullified. Okay? So, uh, Sheikh Albani is saying, touching private parts directly nullifies wudu uh, with or without lust. Okay? And Sheikh Al-Bani is saying the opposite. If one touches someone else's private parts, uh, is his wudu nullified? Sheikh bin Baz says, if it is touched directly, it nullifies the wudu. If it does not, and Sheikh Al-Thaymin says, it does not nullify wudu. So here you have a situation where you have someone believing if you touch yourself, you lose your wudu, or you don't, don't really lose your wudu, but if you... Uh, but you, it's better if you do wudu, like in the case of Sheikh Uthaymin. But if you touch someone else's private parts, you don't lose wudu. Okay. These are the uh, type of inconsistencies that our scholars of the old the predecessors, our predecessors, they used to try to avoid and keep things consistent. Does one lose wudu from eating anything of a camel other than his meat? Sheikh bin Baz says, nothing of the camel nullifies wudu except its meat. Sheikh Uthaymin says, eating anything of the camel nullifies the wudu. Any, anything of the camel nullifies the wudu. There's no difference between meat and the rest. I'm not going into the details because this, you know, is a whole chapter in itself. The Prophet ate a camel meat, then he did wudu. And the assumption is that he lost his wudu because of eating the camel meat rather than he was just not in wudu to begin with. Does a disbeliever have to make ghusl upon becoming a Muslim? Sheikh bin Baz says, it is recommended for a disbeliever to make ghusl upon becoming a Muslim. Sheikh Uthaymin says, the view that a disbeliever must wajib, uh, that, the, that must make ghusl upon becoming Muslim is more likely the correct view, according to Sheikh Uthaymin. Okay? So, and then Sheikh Al-Bani says, it is a wajib, it is a must for a disbeliever to make wudu upon becoming a Muslim. So they disagree in the hukum. Okay? One says it's recommended, one says it is wajib, the other says uh, that it is, you know, it is the correct view. Okay? Uh, what is the ruling regarding making ghusl prior to Friday prayer? Okay? The Friday, the Friday prayer, okay? Prior to that, ghusl yawmul jumu'ah. Sheikh bin Baz says, making ghusl on a Friday is an emphasized sunnah. Sheikh Uthaymin, making ghusl on Friday is wajib. Now remember, when uh, some of the shayukh, they use the word wajib, that is what we usually understand as fard, okay? Sheikh Al-Bani says, ghusl on Friday is obligatory. Over here, meaning fard, he uses the word wajib. If one makes ghusl from an, from, uh, from an intimate relation on a Friday, does it also count as the ghusl for Friday? Sheikh bin Baz says, if someone makes ghusl daytime before Friday prayer after an intimate relationship, it also counts as ghusl for Friday. Sheikh Uthaymin says, if one makes ghusl from an intimate relationship after the sunrise, it counts for him also as ghusl for Friday. Sheikh Al-Bani says, making a ghusl on a Friday from an intimate relationship will not count for him also as ghusl for Friday, even if he makes the intention for both. I don't know where he gets that from, but okay. What is the ruling regarding touching the Qur'an without wudu or in the state of janaba? Meaning you're in a state where you need to make the uh, wudu or in the ghusl. Ibn, Ibn, uh, Ibn Baz says, Bin Baz, Bin Baz says, it is not rec it is not permissible, la yajuz, to touch the Quran without wudu or in a state of janaba. Sheikh Uthaymin says, it is not permissible, la yajuz, to touch the Quran without wudu or in a state of janaba. Sheikh Albani says it is permissible, ya Jews, to touch the Quran without wudu or in a state of janaba. So here you have people who are very strict 
uh, about following Quran and Sunnah, but coming to a very different conclusion. So what is important is not the fatwa. What is important is your principles, your asuls that you use to come to your fatwa. That is what is the main thing. What is the ruling regarding reciting Quran in the state of Janaba? Sheikh bin Baz says, it is not permissible, la yajuz, for the one in the state of Janaba to recite Quran. Sheikh Uthaymin says, it is not permissible, la yajuz, for the one in the state of Janaba to recite Quran. Sheikh Al-Bani says, it is disliked for the one in the state of Janaba to recite Quran. So they disagree on the hukum. One says it's allowed. The other says it's makruh, it's disliked. What is the ruling for who is on for who is on her period, okay, or in the state of Janaba, to stay in a masjid? Sheikh bin Baz says it is not permissible for the one on her period, or for anyone in the state of Janaba, to stay, spend time in a masjid unless one passes through or passes by for in need. Sheikh Uthaymin says it is not permissible. For the one on her period or anyone in a state of Janaba to stay or spend time in the masjid. The only exception is that if one uh, in a state of Janaba makes wudu, then he can stay in a masjid. Sheikh Uthaymin says this. Sheikh Al-Bani says it is permissible, yajuz, for the one on her period or anyone in the state of Janaba to spend time in a masjid. Following Quran and Sunnah, clear cut, cut, clear cut black and white following Qur'an and Sunnah. There's, there should be no difference of opinions. But we do have difference of opinions because when you're looking at the text, the text doesn't tell you what the text is saying. Your mind, your aql tells you what the text is saying. Does a woman have to undo her hair in making usul ritual before her, following her period? Okay, So her days are finished. She's going to make her tahara. Does she have to undo her hair? Sheikh bin Baz says it is recommended mustahab for a woman to undo her hair while making ghusl after her period. <coughs> Sheikh Uthaymin says it is not required la yajuz for a woman to undo her hair while making ghusl after her period. Sheikh Al-Bani says it is obligatory wajib meaning fard for a woman to undo her hair while making ghusl after her period. Now, my question to my Salafi brothers is that if we have enough openness to accept the difference of opinions between Sheikh bin Baz, Sheikh Uthaymin, Sheikh Al-Bani, we have enough, then why not have the same zarf, the same openness, the same inshrahu sadr for Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed, Ahmed bin Hanbal, or other of the great imams that have existed that are valid imams of the ummah. You see, because the Sheikh bin Baz and Sheikh Uthaymin and Sheikh Albani, they are not of the Salaf, they're of the Khalaf. And if, if they can have difference of opinions following Quran and Sunnah, then of course then, the, uh, then we should have, we have as Muslims more right to have more in Shah Sadr, more openness to the difference of opinions of the early predecessors of Islam. Can an impurity najasa be removed without using water? Sheikh bin Baz says, the impurity is not cleaned except with water, save the exceptions which are cleaning after the call of nature. That can be done without water. So if you go to the bathroom and use leaves or some stones that, uh, you know, uh, different types of stones that are like, uh, you know, st uh, stones that are made of sand, for example, uh, Sheikh Uthaymin says impurity can be cleaned with any cleaner as long as it eliminates the impurity. So Sheikh Uthaymin says it's not necessarily water, that's not the real thing. As long as the impurity is removed, that's good. Okay. Sheikh Al-Bani says an impurity can be cleaned with water but not with any other liquid. Okay. Is the liquid that comes out of a woman's private area tahir? Okay. So the liquid that comes out of the woman's private area, is it pure or impure? Again, you're looking at the text, Zahir nas right? So Sheikh bin Baz says what? It is impure. Sheikh Uthaymin says it is Tahir. And Sheikh bin Baz says it is Najas. 
So there's a big difference of opinion here. Okay. Question number 27. What is the ruling regarding the one who does not pray out of negligence and laziness? The one who does not pray is a disbeliever. Sheikh Uthaymin says, that was Sheikh bin Baz. Now Sheikh Uthaymin says, the one who does not pray at all is a disbeliever and apostate. Sheikh Uthaymin. Sheikh Albani, the one who does not pray out of laziness is not a disbeliever. What is the ruling of the one who prays on and off? Sheikh bin Baz says, and may Allah protect us from this uh, completely. Sheikh bin Baz says, he and our, our, our children, us and our children. Sheikh bin Baz, the one who prays on and off, is a disbeliever. Not only that, but he who intentionally delays his prayer until he misses it is also a disbeliever. Sheikh Uthaymin says, he who prays on and off is not a disbeliever. And what is the point here? The point is difference of hukum. Okay? The difference of looking at a matter and coming to a different opinion, even though the Quran and the text for everyone is the same. Okay? It's not like uh, I know more Bukhari than somebody else. We both Bukhari is Bukhari. It's the text is the same. But what happens when you your your mind reads Bukhari? And what asuns I read Bukhari with. That's what makes the difference. What is the ruling for a woman to call adhan and iqama for the prayer? So there's a female, she's at her house, she hears the adhan, she hears the iqama. Okay? Neither the adhan nor the iqama are legal for women. Shaykh Uthaymin, there's no harm, la haraj, if a woman calls iqama for the prayer if she's performing it at her house. Okay? So, it's not in Sharia, according to Bin Baz. It is allowed, according to Sheikh Al-Thaymeen. Sheikh Al-Bani says women are just like men in all issues because they don't see any difference, for example, in the prayers between male and female, so then everything is the same. And, uh, you know, uh, whatever is ordained for men is ordained for the women. Now, if that's a principle, then you would also have to tell the women to raise what? Their, uh, their clothes to their ankles, if that's the principle, right? Okay, so, uh, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Does the color of the adhan of the morning prayer, Fajr say, As-salatu khayru min al during the first adhan or the second adhan after the first of the fajr enters. Sheikh bin Baz said it is sunnah to say As-salatu khayru min al during the second adhan that is called after the time of the fajr prayer enters. Sheikh Uthaymin says the, call, the caller is to say As-salatu khayru min al during the second adhan that is called after the time of the fajr prayer enters. <coughs> Sheikh Al-Bani says, the Sunnah is to say, As-salatu khayru min al during the first adhan and not the second one. Again, different hukam. Okay. Then, question number 31. What is the ruling regarding the recitation of the extra? Verily, you don't break your uh, promise. Where Allah says in the dua of the Prophet, Sheikh la tukhliful mi'ad. Sheikh bin Baz says, the extra, verily you don't break your promise, is narrated with a fair chain. Sheikh Uthaymeen says it's authentic. Sheikh Albani says it's shad. It's very rare. It's, it's, it's not an authentic thing. You don't have to say it. The one who needs to repeat the qaba. <coughs> okay. Uh, does one need to repeat the iqama like one repeats the adhan? So if the, if the muadhin says, Allahu Akbar, you say Allahu Akbar. Sheikh bin Baz said it is recommended mustahab to repeat the iqama just as the azan. Sheikh Uthaymeen says the correct view is that one does not need to repeat the iqama. So in the iqama you don't have to repeat after the person. Uh, Albani says one who hears the iqama does exactly the same as the one who hears the adhan. Is there an emergency time, waqt dhururi for isha prayer? After midnight 
is the emergency time. Waqt dhururi for Isha prayer. Shaykh Uthaymin says the correct opinion is that there is only permissible jawaz, preferred fadila time for Isha. It is not permissible to perform Isha after midnight. Okay? After midnight is the emergency time. So after midnight. And Shaykh Uthaymin is saying there is no Isha prayer after midnight. If the menstruation or postnatal bleeding of a woman ends during the time of a prayer, is she supposed to perform that prayer and the prayer before that? Sheikh bin Baz says, if the menstruation or postnatal bleeding of a woman ends during the time of Asr prayer, she must perform the Asr and the Dhuhr prayers. If this happens during the time of Isha prayer, she must perform both Isha and Maghrib prayers. Sheikh bin Baz says, if the menstruation or postnatal bleeding of a woman ends before sunset, she only has to pray the Asr prayer. If this happens during the time of Isha, she has to only pray Isha prayer. Sheikh Al-Bani says, if the menstruation of a woman ends before the sunset, she has to perform Asr and Dhuhr prayers. If, she happens, if it, this happens after Isha, she has to perform both Isha and Maghrib prayers. Same question. Same texts, different answers. Is the thigh of a man considered private area? Awra. Sheikh bin Baz, yes it is. Sheikh Uthaymin, it is considered private area, awra, inside the salah, but not outside. Sheikh Albani, yes it is. Question number 36. What is the ruling regarding the covering of the feet of the women in prayer? Sheikh bin Baz says it is a must for a woman to cover her feet in the prayer according to the majority of the scholars. Jamhur ul ahlul ilm. Okay, she must cover her prayers according to the majority of the scholars. Sheikh Uthaymin, the view that it is not obligatory uh, is the more evident view. Sheikh Uthaymin, the view is the view that it must be covered is the safer. Uh, view. Sheikh Albani, it is a must wajib for women to cover her feet in the prayer. What is the ruling regarding the covering of the shoulder for men in prayer? Sheikh bin Baz, it is a must to cover one or both shoulders provided one is able. Sheikh Uthaymin, covering one of the shoulders is sunnah, not obligatory. Sheikh Albani, it is a must for the one praying to cover his shoulder provided he's able. Okay? So one is saying it's wajib, the other is saying it's sunnah. But again, the text doesn't tell you if it's fard or sunnah. It is your mind that tells you, looking at the text and the wordings of the text, that should this be wajib or should this be sunnah. What is the ruling regarding the prayer niche? The mihrab found in the masjids. Sheikh bin Baz, the prayer niche is not an innovation, it's not a bid'ah. You know the, the special prayer area where the imam usually prays inside the niche? Sheikh Uthaymin, having a prayer niche in a masjid is permissible. The view that it is recommended, mustahab, is closer to the truth than the view it is disliked. Prayer niche in a masjid is an innovation, bid'ah. Sheikh al Bani. What is the ruling regarding uttering the isti'adha, a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, before Fatiha during the first rakah? Sheikh bin Baz, seeking refuge, isti'adha in the first rakah is sunnah. Sheikh Uthaymin, seeking refuge in the first rakah before Fatiha is sunnah. Sheikh Albani, seeking refuge, isti'adha is wajib, meaning there's a deficiency in the prayer if you don't do it. Question 39. What is the ruling regarding the followers saying Ameen behind the Imam? Sheikh Uthaymin. The followers saying Ameen is an emphasized Sunnah, especially when the Imam says Ameen. Okay? So you know that all, because I'm not mentioning the Hadith behind these questions, but we know the Hadith that's very famous about this. Okay? Sheikh Albani says following, followers saying Ameen is obligatory. You must do it. See, the text doesn't tell you. What is the hukam itself? Is it just sunnah? Or is it going to be fard? Is it, and when they say wajib, they mean fard. When the imam says ameen, you have to say ameen. It's wajib, meaning fard, upon you. Sheikh Uthaymin, Ibn Uthaymin says, 
What? It's Sunnah Mu'akkadah. Question number 40. Is it ordained, meaning part of the Sharia, Yashrah, for the followers behind an Imam to say, Sami Allahu liman hamida, when they raise from bowing down. Okay? So when, when they're coming up, the followers, should they say, Sami Allahu liman hamida? The followers do not say, Sami Allahu liman hamida. Instead, they say, Rabbana lakal hamd. Shaykh Uthaymeen, the followers say, Rabbana lakal hamd, while getting up, not Sami Allahu liman hamida. Shaykh Albani, it is legal for the follower to say, Rabbana lakal hamd. I would go as far as saying it is obligatory. Okay? It is wajib. Question number 41. What is the ruling regarding placing the hands on the chest after getting up from the uh, bowing from the ruku? So you're in the ruku and you get up and you put your hand on the chest. If Sheikh bin Baz placing the hands on the chest after getting up from the bowing post, uh, posture is sunnah. Sheikh Uthaymeen placing the right hand over the left hand on the chest after getting up from the bowing posture is sunnah. Placing Albani, placing the hands on the chest after getting up from the bowing posture is an innovation. So he says, if you put your hands up like this after some after some liman hamida, when you put your hands on your chest like this, this is a bid'ah, according to Shaykh Albani. Again, they're reading the same text, coming to a different conclusion, and they feel that they're all following Quran and Sunnah and have a resentment towards people that were also following Qur'an and Sunnah, but just weren't part of that same group. 42. When is it Sunnah in, when, when is it sunnah in prayer to raise one's hands? Sheikh bin Baz. It is Sunnah to raise the hands in four places during the prayer. During the opening, takbir. During the bowing, getting up from the bowing, and getting up in the third rakah after the tashhad. Okay? Shaykh Uthaymeen, it is not sunnah to raise the hands except in four places according to textual evidences. During the takbir, Allahu Akbar. Before bowing, okay, getting up from the bowing, getting up in the third uh, rakah after the tashhad, okay. Shaykh Albani says, okay, it is sunnah to raise the hands during the opening takbir, before the bowing, getting up from the bowing and not in the third rakah. Okay? It is also sunnah to raise hands during other takbirs, however, it is done intermittently. Okay? So he says you can raise your hands during other takbirs randomly between other takbirs, whether you are doing coming up from sujood or going, you know, at any other time, you can do it randomly. Okay? This is Sheikh Al Bani. Question number forty three when does when a person does when a person goes down to prostrate, does he place his knees or hands first on the ground? Sheikh Albani, when one goes down to prostrate, it is sunnah for him to place the knees first before the hands. Sheikh Uthaymeen, what is ordained for a person going down is to prostrate, is to place his knees before the hand. Sheikh Albani, authentic sunnah practice is to place the hands before the knees. Completely different. For a person going down to prostrate, so you place your what, uh, your knees, uh, place the hands before the knees, according to Sheikh Albani. What is the ruling regarding the squatting between the two prostrations? Okay, so when you are in jalsa, okay, so is it's a type of sunnah, according to Bin Baz. Ibn Uthaymeen says between the two prostrations is not sunnah. What is the ruling regarding squatting? Okay. Albani says between the two prostrations is not sunnah and that should be practiced occasionally. Okay, squatting is when you take out one of your legs when you're sitting. Does one raise his index finger during sitting between the two prostrations? Does one raise his index finger during the sitting between two prostrations? 
bin Baz, the sunnah is not to raise an index finger during this sitting between the two prostrations. Shaykh Uthaymeen, raising the index finger is sunnah during the sitting between the two prostrations, just like in tashhad. tashhad. So, just like you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, during that time when you go into sujood and then you come back up to raise your finger, at that time in any of the ruk ruku, in any of the sujoods, uh, between the sujoods you can do this. Raising the index finger is sunnah during the sitting between two prostrations is just like in tashhad. Uh, Albani, raising the index finger in any sitting other than the tashhad is in innovation, bid'ah. So, they're allowing it. Sheikh Al-Bani is saying it's bid'ah. Uh, is to sit for resting purposes sunnah? Okay. Uh, so, <coughs> Sheikh bin Baz says, Jalasat istiraha, istiraha is unconditional, mutlaq sunnah. Even for the one who is young and healthy. Okay, so just to, uh, like for example, to, to do your stuff and your prayers while sitting. Okay, uh, is sunnah for the one who needs it due to his age, illness, uh, lethargic state, pain in the knees and the like. It is not sunnah unless it is needed. Shaykh Uthaymeen and Shaykh Albani says that it is sunnah, he who claims the Prophet did it when he needed it has no grounds to stand on. So he's saying to Shaykh Uthaymeen, you have no grounds to stand on. If the Imam is not observing the practice of Jalas Istishara, and the one following considers it Sunnah, is it preferred that he performs the Jalasat Istiara or follows the Imam? It is better for the follower to perform the Jalasat Istiara following the Prophet. So he's basically saying it's okay for the follower to break the movement of the imam and have his own movement and pray sitting uh, when even there's no need for sitting it's better for him to, it's it's better for him to to do the sunnah than to be in the same position as the imam shaykh uthaymeen it is better for the follower to to leave jalasat ishtara and follow his imam shaykh albani says the follower needs to follow his imam When one goes down to perform prostration after the first rakah, or those that follow, should he lean on his or on on his hands or knees first? When getting up, should he lift off his knees or hands first? Okay. So the sunnah practice is to put his knees first before going down and lift his hands first getting up. Shaykh Uthaymeen says the one one is to put his knees first going down and lift his hands first getting up. So both uh, Bin Baz and Uthaymeen, they agree. Sheikh Al-Bani says the sunnah practice is to put the hands first going down, opposite, and lift the knees first uh, getting up. So completely opposite. Again, the text is the same. Opinions are different. The, the Bukhari for Sheikh Bin Baz and Albani didn't change. It's the same Bukhari, same, same Sahih Muslim, but different, uh, you have different uh, hukums. Does one, say during, does one say during the Tashhad, peace be upon you, O Prophet? Right? Uh, Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. Okay? Or, uh, Assalamu ala nabi. Okay? Do you say Assalamu alayka, assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabi? Or do you say Assalam ala Nabi? Shaykh Uthaymeen, one is to say Assalamu alayka, Assalamu alayka ayyuhan Nabi. This is Shaykh Uthaymeen. The formula, peace be upon you, O Prophet, and uh, and then Assalamu alayka ayyuhan Nabi was used during the lifetime of the Prophet. After his departure, the companions used to say Assalamu ala Nabi. So this is the difference of opinion between Sheikh Uthaymeen says leave it as it is. Sheikh Al-Bani says no, we need to change it. What is the ruling regarding praying more rakah than reported from the Prophet ﷺ during Taraweeh? It is preferred to pray as many rakahs as did the Prophet, 
but if one prays more, there's more, there is room for it, and no harm is done. Sheikh bin Baz. Sheikh Uthaymin, it is preferred to pray as many rakahs as the Prophet did, but if one prays more, there is room for it, and no harm is done. Sheikh Albani says, it is a must to limit the number of rakahs of the Trawi prayer to that which is reported from the Prophet wasallam. It is not permissible, la yajus, to pray more. What is the ruling regarding the supplication <coughs> of finishing the Qur'an? Dua khutmu al-Qur'an. Sheikh bin Baz says there's no harm la ba'sa fihi in performing the supplication of finishing the Qur'an either inside or inside or outside the prayer. Sheikh Uthaymin says performing the supplication of finishing the Qur'an inside pr the prayer is not legal. Okay? Ghayru shari, you can say. What is the ruling regarding taking a short break between obligatory uh, farida and optional nawafil prayer? So what is the ruling regarding taking a short break between fard and nafil prayers? Bin Baz, one ought to either talk or leave the masjid after obligatory prayer before starting an optional one. So Sheikh Bin Baz believes that if I did my fard prayers, I must uh, talk to somebody or I have to leave the masjid before I can do nafal prayers. Sheikh Uthaymin says it is recommended to either talk or to move in a different location after obligatory prayer before starting the optional one. Okay. Sheikh Albani, it is not permissible to start the optional prayer after the obligatory one without either talking or leaving the masjid. Okay. So, uh, you did your prayers, you change your location, or you talk. There's difference of opinions on this issue, but the text again is the same. Question number 53 Is it legal, mashru, to perform takbir for the prostration of the recitation outside the prayer? Okay, is it legal to perform takbir for, uh, for the prostration of recitation outside the prayer? Sheikh bin Baz says it is legal to perform takbir for the prostration of the recitation outside prayer. Okay? So, uh, Sheikh Uthaymin says, whoever performs prostration of recitation outside the prayer, he says takbir. Okay? So, is it legal to perform takbir? So, saying Allahu Akbar when you're doing your sujood, right? Uh, uh, outside prayer. Okay? Sheikh Albani says it is illegal to perform takbir for prostration of recitation outside prayer. So he says, you make your sujood, you don't say your takbir. Question number 54. What is the ruling regarding the prayer of greeting the masjid, tahiyatul masjid? Sheikh bin Baz, the prayer of greeting of the masjid emphasized sunnah, sunnah mu'akkida. Sheikh Uthaymin, the prayer of greeting the masjid is an emphasized sunnah. Sheikh Al-Bani, the prayer of greeting the masjid is an obligatory, it's wajib, it's fard. What is the ruling regarding Salat al-Tasbih? Sheikh bin Baz, it is not legal to perform Salat al-Tasbih since all ahadiths on this subject are either anal, either their shad or their weak. Sheikh Uthaymin, Salat al-Tasbih is not legal due to the lack of authentic narrations from the Prophet. Sheikh Al-Bani, all narrations of the hadith regarding Salat al-Tasbih are authentic. Wow, this is a big one. Big difference. What is the ruling regarding praying the optional prayer after Asr prayer? Sheikh bin Baz says, it is not permissible to perform optional prayers after Asr prayer except for the prayers certain, except for prayers of certain occasions. Okay, like for example, Tahiyat masjid Sheikh Uthaymin, it is not permissible to perform any prayer after Asr until the sunset except the obligatory prayers and the prayers of certain occasions. It is permissible to perform optional prayers after Asr until the sun becomes ye yellowish. So Sheikh Al-Bani allows it, the other two really don't allow it with the exception of some prayers. Question number 57, is the multiplication of the reward of a prayer in the sacred mosque in Mecca limited to the physical mosque or does it include the wider boundary of what is called haram? The multiplication of reward of prayer 
includes the wider boundary of haram. Sheikh Uthaymin says the multiplication of the reward of prayer is limited to the physical mosque containing the Kaaba and does not include the rest of Mecca or greater, greater haram. Question number 58. What is the ruling for repeating the congregational repair in a mas uh, prayer in a masjid that has a salaried imam and a mu'adhin? Okay. Sheikh bin Baz, if some people miss the first or the main congregational in the masjid, it is legal for them to pray in uh, pray there in congregation the second time. So, if there is a formal prayer, formal dhuhr prayer by the official imam done, then can you come and make another congregation, a jama'ah? Okay, so this is the question. So he says, Sheikh bin Baz says it's allowed. Sheikh Uthaymin it is of sunnah practice to pray in congregation for those that missed the congregation of the salaried imam of a masjid provided they don't turn this into a habit. Sheikh Albani, it is disliked to establish a second congregation in a masjid that has, been, uh, that has a salaried imam in muadhin. So Sheikh Albani here agrees with the Hanafi opinion. Question 59. What is the ruling regarding the recitation of the followers uh, of the followers of Fatiha in an audible prayer behind an imam. Sheikh bin Baz, it is obligatory for the followers to recite Fatiha behind an imam both in Jahriya and Sirriya prayers. So, of course, uh, Sheikh bin Baz says this. Uh, Sheikh Uthaymin says it is, it is wajib, meaning fard, for the followers to recite Fatiha behind an imam both in Jahriya and Sirriya prayers. Sheikh Albani says it is wajib, meaning fard, for the followers to recite Fatiha behind an imam in non-audible Syria prayers, meaning if the Imam is not reciting out loud, Sheikh Albani says you should read Fatiha. The recitation of Fatiha by, behind by the follower behind an Imam in an audible, if he's being reading, uh, uh, if he if the Imam is reading Fatiha out loud, then it is mansuh is abrogated. We don't follow it. This is the opinion of Sheikh Albani. I'm very surprised. Over here, Sheikh Albani takes the Maliki position. What is the ruling regarding the fall the followers praying seated behind an Imam who is praying seated? What is the ruling regarding the followers praying seated behind an Imam who is praying seated? It is more preferable for the followers to sit and pray behind a salaried Imam praying seated. But if they stand and pray, there is no harm done. Shaykh Uthaymin, if the Imam starts the prayer sitting, then it is obligatory for the followers to pray behind him sitting. Obligatory. Okay. Shaykh Albani, it is recommended mustahab for the followers to sit behind an Imam who is praying is seated. It is permissible jais to pray standing behind an Imam who is seated. On another occasion he said, the answer with which I feel at ease is that praying behind, uh, praying seated behind an Imam is... Uh, who is seated is obligatory. Is praying on the right side of an imam in, in a given line more virtuous than the left side or the virtue is based on the proximity to the imam? Sheikh bin Baz, the right side of each line behind the imam is more virtuous than the left side. Sheikh Uthaymin, the right side of the line is more virtuous if they are at the same distance to the imam Otherwise, the closer location to the imam is more virtuous. Question number 62. If someone enters the masjid and finds the imam in a bowing, prost uh, uh, bowing posture, is it legal for him to bow down and walk to the closest line in that posture, or should he try to get to the line before bowing down? This is based upon the hadith that some of the sahaba, they used to... Uh, get into the position of the Prophet and then walk up to the prayer lines. So, uh, of course, this is uh, moving in prayer. You know, getting into prayer uh, before you get to the line is problematic. Uh, but anyway, if someone enters the masjid and finds the Imam in a bowing posture, it is not legal for him to bow down before reaching the line. Sheikh Uthaymin, it is not legal for the latecomer to bow down before reaching the line. Sheikh Albani, it is sunnah to bow down before reaching the line and walk to the line in the bowing posture. Okay, so over here, 
uh, like in the case of Sheikh Albani, there's no consideration of the fact that uh, they were taught prayer in stages, right? Question number 63. What is the ruling regarding the one who can't find a place in the last row and stands alone in a row? So, as you know, the condition of a saf is there should be at least two people, okay, in a jama'ah. So, the, the condition of the jama'ah is it has to have safuf, saf, and the condition of the saf is it has to have more than one person. In general, that's the rule. Sheikh bin Baz, the prayer of the one standing by himself in a row is not valid. Ghayru sahih. Sheikh Uthaymin, this is why in some of the Hanafi opinions, you bring the person from the, fr the row ahead of you out to you. Sheikh Uthaymin, it is not it can, if he cannot find a room in the last row and prays by himself, his prayer is valid. If he cannot, uh, Sheikh Albani, if he cannot find a room in the last row and prays behind himself, behind himself, his prayer is valid. Question number sixty-four: If someone enters a masjid and finds the rows full, is he to proceed to stand to the right of the imam? Okay, answer: He. Uh, he'd take a position to the right of the Imam if he's able to. Sheikh Uthaymin, to proceed to stand to the right of the Imam is not a sunnah. Okay, that's Sheikh Uthaymin versus Sheikh bin Baz. If someone is emitting bad smell whereby the others may be bothered, be it from his mouth, his nose, his armpit, or from eating an onion or garlic, is he prevented from entering the masjid? Sheikh bin Ba'as, such a person is prevented from entering the masjid until he does whatever it takes to eliminate the bad smell. Sheikh Uthaymin, such a person is prevented from entering a masjid until he does whatever it takes to eliminate the bad smell. Sheikh Albani, such a person is not prevented from entering a masjid. Okay, which is interesting because, uh, you know, if you go on Dahir of the text, the Prophet said for those people not to enter the masjid. What is the minimum distance traveled for someone to be considered a legal traveler? The majority of Sheikh bin Baz, the majority of scholars are of the opinion that the minimum distance is 80 kilometers for a legal journey. Sheikh Uthaymin, the correct opinion is that there is no set distance. Whatever is considered a travel in the custom of the people, which is the legal journey. Sheikh Albani, whatever is considered a travel in the custom of the people, which is a legal journey. So, uh, Sheikh uh, bin Baz gives the 80 kilometers and the others say it's according to the customs of the people. What is the ruling regarding shortening the prayer while on journey? Sheikh bin Baz, it is sunnah for the legal traveler to shorten the prayers. It is more preferable to shorten than not. Sheikh Uthaymin, shortening the prayer is a, in a legal journey is encouraged and not obligatory. Likewise, not shortening is disliked but not forbidden. Sheikh Albani, shortening the prayer is legal, in illegal travel is obligatory, meaning you must make it shorter. Okay. How long can someone stay in a place and be considered a traveler? Sheikh bin Baz, if someone intends to stay more than four days in a place, he is no longer considered a legal traveler and cannot take advantage of the exceptions that apply to a traveler. Sheikh Uthaymin, as long as the traveler stays in a locality for a certain need or for a certain limited duration, he's considered a legal traveler. Completely different. What is the ruling regarding the, the combining of prayers for a resident if he finds it difficult to perform the two prayers in their own time. Sheikh bin Bas, it is not permissible to combine two prayers without a legal shari excuse. As for the combination reported uh, in the hadith of Ibn Abbas uh, was for a valid excuse or a symbolic combination. Sheikh Uthaymin, it is not com if not combining two prayers poses a difficulty for an individual, it is permissible for him to combine the prayers. If a Muslim experiences difficulty in praying each prayer in its dedicated time, it is permissible for him to combine. Sheikh Albani, the combination of two prayers is permissible to remove the difficulty. Again, there's a difference in the hukum that they give. Question number 70. Is it permissible to establish Friday prayer outside the cities like in deserts? Sheikh bin Baz. People who live in the desert, Ahlul Badawi, 
do not have to perform Friday prayers. Sheikh Uthaymin, it is not necessary for the inhabitants of a desert to establish Friday, Friday prayer. Actually, it is not accepted from them if they establish it. Sheikh Albani, Friday prayer is performed outside of cities or towns like places where people gather in the desert. Okay, completely different hukum. How many people are needed to establish the Friday prayer? Sheikh bin Baz, there, is, there has to be three or more people in order to pray the Friday prayer. Sheikh Uthaymin, the Friday prayer can be performed with three or more people. Sheikh Albani, the Friday prayer can be formed with as many people as needed for an ordinary congregational prayer. So that's two. Question number 72, it is legal to call the first Adhan in our time. Sheikh bin Baz, the first Adhan for Friday is legal. Sheikh Uthaymin, the first Adhan for Friday is legal. Sheikh Albani, it is enough to start with the Adhan that is called when the Imam ascends to the pulpit due to the fact that the need is no longer that there be a uh, that n n the need is no longer there that made Uthman radiallahu institute it therefore not calling the first adhan is of the sunnah of the prophet therefore not calling the first as you know how Friday there's generally two adhans so he's saying don't do the first adhan just do the one adhan right before the khutbah Again, this is an asuli question, uh, just to clarify. If a khalifa gives a hukum, there was ijma' upon it, does the ijma' of the khalifa of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, does it last till the Day of Judgment? Or can it be undone? Un under what conditions? Question number 73. If the Prophet is mentioned during the Friday sermon, does one ask for peace and blessings upon the Prophet wasallam? Sheikh bin Baz, Yes, it is legal to do that, but it has to be done quietly. Sheikh Uthaymeen, there's no harm in doing that quietly while the Prophet men is mentioned in the sermon. Sheikh Albani, asking for peace and blessings upon the Prophet during the sermon prayer is included in including among the chit-chat that is prohibited. Okay? That's Sheikh Albani. The Eid prayer. What is the ruling regarding women going to Eid prayers? Sheikh bin Baz, it is emphasized sunnah for women to go to Eid prayers. Sheikh Uthaymeen, it is sunnah for women to go to Eid prayer. Sheikh Albani, it is obligatory for women to go to the Eid prayer. Okay, emphasize sunnah, sunnah uh, versus it is fard. Okay. What is the ruling regarding raising the hands with every takbir in Eid prayer? Sheikh Uthaymeen, raising the hands with each takbir in the prayer of Eid is sunnah. Sheikh Albani, raising the hands in each takbir in the prayer of Eid is not sunnah. Okay. Question number 76. When someone comes to the place where the Eid prayer will be performed, does he sit or, per or perform turaka, greeting of the masjid? When someone comes to a place where the Eid prayer will be performed, does he uh, sit or does he perform attahatul masjid? Sheikh bin Ba'a's sunnah practice is to sit down upon arriving the place of Eid prayer without praying at Tahiyat al-Masjid. Sheikh Uthaymeen, whoever arrives at the Eid prayer does not sit down until he prays at Tahiyat al-Masjid. Completely different answer. Sheikh Uthaymeen, if someone misses the Eid prayer, is it legal for him to make it up? Sheikh bin Ba'a's, whoever misses the Eid prayer, makes it up as, makes it up as is. It is. Sheikh Uthaymeen, it is not legal for the one who missed the Eid prayer to make it up, which is proper answer, actually. 77. Question number 78. What is the ruling regarding the solar eclipse prayer? Sheikh bin Baz, the solar eclipse prayer is an emphasized sunnah, sunnah mu'akida. Uh, Sheikh Uthaymeen, the solar eclipse prayer is a communal obligation, fardul kafaya. Sheikh al-Bani, solar eclipse is obligatory. Completely different answers by all three. But yet, they're all reading the same Ahadith from which they're coming to this istidlal and this hukam. Does the solar and lunar eclipse or hap, hap, or they happen on a specific day of the month? The solar eclipse and lunar eclipse can occur any day of the month. Jehuthaymin, the solar and lunar eclipse do not happen except on known specific days and nights. 
It's not necessarily a difference of opinion, but fasting. If someone thought that the sun had set and broke his fast, and then it became evident for him that it hadn't set, does he have to make that day up? Sheikh bin Bas. Yes, he has to make it up. Sheikh Uthaymin. He doesn't have to make it up. Okay. But they're all reading the same Bukhari, right? The same text. If someone is eating and drinking and the Fajr time enters, what does he do? Sheikh bin Baz, what is obligatory on him is to stop eating and drinking as soon as he finds out that the Fajr time has entered. Sheikh Uthaymin, if the caller of the Adhan is known to call the Adhan after the start of Fajr, he must stop eating at once when he hears the Adhan. Sheikh Al-Bani, if the Fajr time enters and someone has food or drink in his hand, he must yajib, he must take from it what he needs before putting it down. Sheikh Al-Bani has a different answer. Sheikh, uh, question number 82. Is fasting on behalf of a deceased person limited to fast of a promise? Okay. Uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh bin Baz, according to the most correct opinion of the opinions of the scholars, one can fast on behalf of a deceased person, be it the fast of promise or Ramadan or any makeup of kafara. Sheikh bin Uthaymin. It is permissible to fast on behalf of the deceased person for the fast that is obligatory to be original obligation like that of Ramadan or an imposed obligation like that of a, uh, of a promise. Sheikh Albani, what is permissible for a guardian of a deceased person is to fast on behalf of the fast of the promise. No one can fast the obligatory, uh, ob obligatory one on behalf of another. Okay, so they're different completely there. Uh, question number 83, what is the ruling regarding performing optional fasts only on Fridays? Sheikh bin Baz, performing optional fasting on Fridays alone is not permissible unless the day, uh, unless the day of Arafah or the day of Ashura falls on a Friday. In this case, there is no harm fasting on a Friday. Sheikh Uthaymin, fasting Fridays alone is disliked. Sheikh Al-Bani, performing optional fasting on Fridays alone is not permissible even if the day of Arafah or the day of Ashura falls on a Friday. It's completely different. Question number 84. What is the ruling regarding optional fast on Saturdays? Optional fasting on Saturdays is permissible according to Bin Baz. Uh, I think they meant to say um, uh, Uthaymin. Optional fasting on Saturdays is permissible. Fasting on Saturdays is disliked. Uh, if it is done without reason. Sheikh al-Bani, it is not permissible to fast on Saturdays except for the obligatory fast. If someone, is intention if someone intentionally does not fast the month of Ramadan, is it legal for him to make it up? Sheikh bin Baz, whoever does not fast the month of Ramadan intentionally without an illegal excuse, he must repent and make it up. Sheikh Uthaymin, whoever does not fast the month of Ramadan intentionally without a legal excuse, he does not need to make it up. Sheikh Albani, it is not permissible for someone to make up a fast of Ramadan that intentionally broke except for breaking one's fast due to copulation. Okay? So, uh, sacrifice. What is the ruling of sacrifice? Answer, Sheikh bin Baz. The sacrifice is emphasized sunnah, sunnah mu'akidah, not wajib, not far. Okay, Sheikh Uthaymin, the sacrifice is emphasized sunnah for the one who can afford it. Sheikh Al-Bani, the sacrifice is a wajib, is obligatory. What is the ruling regarding offering sacrifice on behalf of a deceased person if he did not ask for it to be done? Offering a sacrifice on, a, on behalf of a deceased person is legal. Sheikh Uthaymin, offering a sacrifice on behalf of a deceased person is not legal. Sacrificing on behalf of a deceased person without prior request from the deceased person is not sunnah. Question number 88. Now we're coming to issues of aqidah. What is the ruling regarding aqiqa? Sorry, uh, 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 rulings regarding aqiqa. Aqiqa is an emphasized sunnah and is not wajib. Uh, Sheikh Uthaymin, same thing. Uh, it is emphasized sunnah. Sheikh al-Bani, it is wajib. It is a fort. Question number 80, uh, 89. What is the ruling regarding taking the name Abdul Muttalib? Sheikh bin Baz, taking the name Abdul Muttalib is permissible. Sheikh Uthaymin, it is not permissible. 
for a person to name his son uh, Abdul Muttalib. Question number 90. What is the ruling regarding taking the nickname Al Abu Al Qasim? It is permissible to take the nickname Abu Al Qasim. It is also permissible to be named Muhammad and take the name nickname Abu Al Qasim after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Shaykh Uthaymeen, it is permissible to take the nickname Abu Al Qasim after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Shaykh Al Bani, it is not permissible to take the nickname Abu Al Qasim irrespective of one's name is Muhammad or not. What is the ruling regarding seeking the help of disbelievers to fight other disbelievers? Sheikh bin Baz, it is permissible to seek help of disbelievers to fight other disbelievers. Sheikh Uthaymeen, it is permissible to seek help of disbelievers to fight other disbelievers. Sheikh Al-Bani, it is not permissible to seek help of disbelievers to fight other disbelievers. Very different answer. Uh, what is the ruling regarding the selling of a dog? Sheikh bin Baz, dogs are not to be sold even if it is for hunting purposes. Sheikh Uthaymeen, it is not legal to sell a dog even if it is for hunting purposes. Sheikh Albani, it is permissible to sell a dog for hunting purposes. This is an exception to the prohibition of taking money for, from the sale of a dog. Conditions of a sale. Is it permissible to combine two conditions in one sale? Sheikh, uh, Sheikh bin Baz and this is a direct hadith of the Prophet so it's interesting how they differ it is not permissible to combine two conditions in one sale Sheikh Uthaymin, it is permissible to combine two or more conditions in one sale taking money for teaching Quran what is the ruling regarding taking money from teaching Quran Sheikh bin Baz, there's no problem in taking money for teaching Qur'an. Sheikh Uthaymeen, it is permissible to take money for teaching Qur'an. Sheikh Al-Bani, it is not permissible to take money for teaching Qur'an. Giving, gifts and giving. How does one balance what one gives to his sons and daughters in terms of wealth or money? Sheikh bin Baz, this is like the inheritance. One gives twice as much to the sons as the daughters. Sheikh Uthaymeen, one does decides to give his kids, one gives twice as much to the sons as the daughters. Sheikh Al-Bani, one has to give equal amount to the sons and the daughters. Okay, question number 96. Is it permissible for a father to marry off his daughter who is less than nine years old without her permission? Sheikh bin Baz, if a girl is younger than nine years old, her father is in charge of her marriage to matching person without her permission. Sheikh Uthaymeen, the father does not marry off his daughter until she reaches the age where she can be asked for her consent and he asks for her approval before marrying her off. Okay. Ladies to marry. Forbidden ladies to marry. What is the ruling regarding a man marrying a woman but he has the intention of to divorce her after a while? Sheikh bin Baz says it is permissible. Sheikh Uthaymeen says technically the marriage in this case is lawful, but it is forbidden from the point of view that it is deceitful and tre treacherous for the lady and her family. Dowry. If a man marries a lady and they are alone, uh, they are alone, but the man divorces her without touching her, how much of the dowry is she entitled to? Sheikh Uthaymeen, being alone for a man and a woman implies intercourse, hence if he has he is alone with her, then he then she is entitled to all of the dowry. Sheikh Al Bani, if a man is alone with a woman but he divorces her without touching her, she is entitled to half the dowry. Very different answer. Wedding banquet, the walima. What is the ruling regarding the walima? Wedding banquets are an emphasized sunnah, Sheikh Uthaymeen. Wedding banquets are an emphasized sunnah, Sheikh Al Bani. Wedding banquets are Wajib. The problem, you know, I find with Sheikh Al-Bani specifically is that if he's going to put very emphasized sunnahs as wajib, then prayer is also wajib. So there's no distinction between a walima and a salah uh, in his way of thinking. Question 100, divorce. Can one divorce his wife while she is on her period? According to Sheikh Al-Bani, 
According to the most correct view, divorce cannot take place during one's period. Sheikh Uthaymin, divorce cannot take place during one's period. Sheikh Albani, divorce can take place during one's period. Okay. So let me read to you the conclusion. So who will take who will you take your answers from? Are you in a position to decipher who is right, who is wrong, or will you just trust their knowledge and follow one of them? If you do, isn't that just a fifth mazhab? Okay, how is it different from following one of the four imams? All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's bl blessings and peace of Allah be upon our Master Prophet Muhammad wasallam, upon his companions and upon those who follow in their footsteps until the Day of Judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this little effort as a means for disseminating of truth. Ameen. Allahumma ameen. So let me end with these concluding remarks that uh, the point here was to show you, number one, if you have enough wus'ah, if you have enough inshallah sadr to tolerate the difference between Shaykh Uthaymeen, Shaykh Albani, Shaykh bin Baz, then you should have more inshallah sadr for the other imams of these of the actual salaf of the actual salaf right and number two it's not about uh, I, I know the Quran and Sunnah and I know the Quran and Sunnah and I know the Quran and Sunnah and it's black and white see this is the proof no you have to have a suns and when you have a suns as has been demonstrated when you have principles whatever they are right when you have principles, whatever they are, when you apply your mind to the text with the tools of those asuls, right? When you're applying those asuls upon the text, different people will come to different conclusions. And number two, even if somebody is saying Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah, he and she will also come to different conclusions. Because the difference will not be in the text. The text is always going to be the same. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmizi, they're always going to be the same. But the lens by which you look at them, okay, is this general, is this specific? Is there a hukum here or there's no hukum here? Is the hadith da'if or is it authentic, right? D what did the Sahaba ha hold as an opinion? So on and so forth. All those tools that you would use to make a take a position. This is the, the Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali schools are not strong because of their reading of the text only. They are strong because of the principles that they bring in teaching you how to read those texts. Teaching you how to read those texts is the more important thing. And if you study Quran and Sunnah, you will have difference of opinions. Quran and Sunnah is not a guarantee in of itself of unity. In fact, Quran and Sunnah in of itself, without the proper tools, is a guarantee divider of the Ummah. It will not unite us, it will divide us. As has been happening with the Salafi brothers, they get divided into every time there's a new big scholar, it gets more divided and then more divided and then more divided. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us unite. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts to uh, the pious predecessors and, uh, and to give us the inshirah sadr to spiritually connect with the great ones like Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, Imam Malik. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon them all and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connect us spiritually with them uh, and to have uh, us rely on their opinions more than the people of the Khalaf unless the only exception maybe I can you know it has to do with you know something of our times like let's say blood transplant or uh, heart surgery or things like this nature of course then we need to apply uh, the knowledge that we have of the times that we live in but in terms of Asul in terms of Asul in terms of the uh, where we will go back to. Uh, it's not as simple as saying Quran and Sunnah and Quran and Sunnah. And uh, the Prophet never emphasized Quran and Sunnah. The companions and no one ever said Quran and Sunnah as such. As such, I'm saying. It was implied, right? 
but also the Sahaba were implied. Also, uh, you know, the, the Khulafa were implied in different narrations. So we have to be careful about this and we have to be clear about the tools we're using to make our judgments. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.